And so you watch the NBA final. Is that a uh, usual Halloween activity for uh, Rita Sushnaus? <laughs> yeah, that's why I watched this <laughs> the the worst finals ever, like the scariest, oh, so the, scary. ugly, the so ugliest. Yeah, the One game ended 75-72. Uh, it, it 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 had the lowest ah, scoring beautiful basketball. <laughs> lowest scoring NBA finals first half or something like that. Like it, it's something so, for the basketball purists to watch. <laughs> Last week I said, uh, what, "What are the vibes in the Euroleague?" Uh, we we didn't really get to to the to the answer here, but uh, I guess this week we could say it's spooky, spooky season in the Euroleague. I don't know what's the spookiest though. What is the scaring refs? you? The refs, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Like that's the where I was next going. Halloween, you could dress up in orange, <laughs> mm, like like a, a Euroleague, pumpkin. like a Euroleague referee. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it scare yeah. a lot of people. It's, it's never been as loud. Well, probably has been last. Every time. season, it <laughs> Every is season just is as loud same. as it is yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's crazy. It's crazy how how much uh, heat they're getting right now. And and to be honest, for some really bad calls, let's not be you know. Yeah. There 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 have been a lot of questionable stuff happening in in many games, and I've been you know. Uh, looking at it from a neutral standpoint usually mm. and I see it both ways you know of course team fans see it one way always but I, I, I've seen it both ways uh, a lot of calls that even go against the rule book sometimes they, they, they replay episodes that shouldn't be allowed to replay and a lot of things like that happening so there we are the EuroLeague the referees are on the hot seat as usual but let's talk about uh, some more positive things. Uh, today we have to talk about Olympia Kos, who had a great double week. We can talk about that Jalgiris uh, Serena Zvezda game uh, because I think it had a lot of emotions attached to it and a lot of narratives. So we can talk about that. Uh, we'll also take a look at the best signings sli- slash transfers of the October. We'll choose one each. Uh, and give our arguments why Uh, also tell which of the teams in the standings is the biggest uh, anomaly because there are so many unexpected results in my eyes and we can talk about that and at the end look at the all october euroleague team and the mvp ladder uh, the top three candidates and if we'll have more time we'll add some extra topics (laughs) But to start with uh, Olympia Kos, I think we should give them some spotlight. They had a rough uh, few rounds before. Uh, they were coming off two losses, both losses uh, in a row, let's say, against teams that were they were actually leading in the game, controlling the game in FS and Bayern uh, game. And now they had two wins against the two and Spanish the, uh, teams. And they lost the Greek derby. In the weekend. In the yes, weekend, so. correct, correct. So this was a very important... Uh, bounce back double week for them. They won the first game against Real Madrid on Tuesday, quite a back and forth game. And now a blowout against Barcelona yesterday. I, I believe you were uh, watching and, or rather, commentating, working on both of these games. Yeah. Um, do you think there's a slight concern in terms of Olympia uh tendency to let go of the games we can even remember the Jalgiris game where they were leading after the first quarter let it go and Mm -hmm. these few games that they let go the lead and now they had a different week you think there's a concern or I think they had a wake-up call and and their reaction was this week Uh, like so far they won all home games in the EuroLeague and they lost all away games so now it's time to start winning on the road but this week I saw Olympia cosplayers aggressive, focused, focused on details, uh, aggressive on defense, running in transition, getting easy points. Uh, Barzokas using his rotation as it is usual with him on a double game week. So everything clicked, everything worked. Actually, against Real Madrid, they were down, let's say, in the middle of the third quarter. But this, it was just because they couldn't convert great opportunities, great looks. It didn't seem to me that Madrid is playing better at the time, mm. even though they were leading. I just thought like Olympiacos needs one good run, a couple of shots to go in, and they might break the game. And that That's is what actually happened. what happened. Yeah, and, and Barcelona game was 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 different. I kind of felt like Barcelona entered the court satisfied with themselves getting the win in in Istanbul. Like they did the minimum requirement for this double game week. 
and there was a lack of energy. They were losing all the 50-50 balls. They were turning the ball over, sloppy plays, and Olympiacos, even with 10 turnovers in the first half, still managed to build the lead because of their offensive rebounding. Mm. And in the end, they had 16 offensive rebounds. First time this season we saw real Nikola Milutinov. He had six offensive rebounds. He had 12 points. And Shaq McKissick, again, with his crazy energy, he's an energy shifter. Like, when he entered that game, everything changed. The rhythm of the game changed. The end of that first quarter, they, I think. They ended the second quarter with three dunks in a row. Was it, wasn't, that, wasn't that the first oh, quarter? Or maybe first, the, first, the first Yeah, quarter. the first quarter. Yeah, first quarter. Moses, Moses Wright, Wright twice? With, with a couple two-handed mm-hmm. dunks, and uh-huh. then Shaq McKissick with the Shaq attack dunk. And you know how important it is for the home crowd, the mm-hmm. spectacular plays, dunks, blocks, uh, buzzer beaters. It's almost it, like... It, br- it gets people going. It's almost where Barcelona broke in that game. Sort of, yeah. They, they kind of kept it close I mean, throughout the second quarter, but then from second half it was domina- domination. Barca started okay, like there was walk-up on punter, but off the screens, uh, punter managed to get a couple of uh, mid-range jump shots and, and score the first four points, and Jabari Parker scored. But... I think in the second half, Olympiacos did a, did a really good job on Punder. Mm-hmm. Uh, they basically stopped him. Uh, they didn't let him get the ball in his hands in comfortable situations. There was always somebody attached to him. And like he finished with his averages, with his usual numbers, but he scored 11 in the first half, and then he scored 7 in the second part of the fourth quarter when Olympiacos was but already leading matter. by 20 and the game was basically finished. So uh, I think defensively they stepped up even in the second half. So both games were kind of different, but they faced really good teams, the best that Spain could offer. Barcelona was uh, sharing uh, they, the first place with the Schalke. They were 5-1. One. They, they were 5-1. And they were coming in after a really solid performance against FS. So... Credit to Olympiacos. I think the two losses before and the loss in the Greek derby maybe was just like a wake-up call. Even uh, against uh, Fenerbahce, I would say they they had that game not in control, but they were close. Yeah. And that fourth quarter, they fell apart. But like I, been... I cannot imagine a team with this much quality and with this depth struggling throughout the regular season. They, they should be cruising through the regular mm. season. And I saw some positives really uh, with Evan Fournier. Yeah. Best game so far, maybe? I wanted to mention that. Yeah, please. Just uh, in the third quarter when they were uh, like uh, up by six or four points, uh, he, he had three huge shots. And I just thought with every game, he's he's getting a little more, you know, adjusted to the system, to how Olympiacos plays. He understands where to attack. He looks, uh, he, he's not, uh, he seems to me like not forcing the stuff anymore. So much, yeah. And uh, I love that Bertzaka sometimes has off-ball plays for him to just get him an open layup at the start of the game for him to feel the rhythm. But uh, his his offense in the first quarter was crucial. He had the three pointer, he had a post up, he where he got fouled, he had another long shot, and after that, Olympiacos really never looked back to Barcelona, mm-hmm. just ballooned the lead. So. I think they are okay. I think it's normal that you have, you know, Vizenkov is back, okay? He knows the system, but he he hasn't been there for one year. Evan Fournier is completely new. Tyler Dorsey is coming back again. Luca Vildoza is a new player. You you have guys that have to, you know, adjust to new to the system, back, you know, to the habits, to, to new players. So you can't expect them to win every game like like they've been doing uh, last couple of years. So I think they improved their weaknesses, and uh, I expect them to just start winning away games. Yeah, uh, yeah. really but soon. What a luxury it is to have Tyler Dorsey sitting out the game against Real Madrid, still winning it, and then playing him in the second game against Barcelona. We're talking about Tyler Dorsey with. With Olympiacos team, you could say that. I, I I remember before the start of the season, I think uh, I found out like the salary of Shaq McKissick that is like seven hundred k, I think, or something. And I know that other teams are paying for guys way worse than Shaq McKissick, like one point five million. And I'm like, how is this guy getting only seven hundred k? That's such a steal for this team. I mean, defensively, athletically, elite. Now he's. Okay, la- last couple of seasons we would uh, use uh, 
used to see him like only perform in the playoffs really well. Or he would play, let's say, one game out of five in a regular season on, on that level. And now he's playing four out of five, I would say, yeah, just to start the exactly. season. Actually, uh, he's even hitting hitting his uh, his three pointers. It's a small sample size still, but the the percentages are good. The percentages are great, and, and you know, this week in 20 minutes, 12.5 points, just a game changer off the bench immediately, and he's been doing that in in almost every game this season. So you I have just, Alec Peters as well, like talking about the guys who can. A starting uh, four last year. Like he was the replacement for Vizenkov last season, and now he's again the backup for Vizenkov. <laughs> and he was and he was performing. You know, he he filled the shoes at least halfway last, yeah, last year. Yeah, he was. He, and he is good. He's he's a Euroleague vet now. You could say he's he has a lot of experience. And like, Shaq- you, like you said the, in the broadcast, actually, you said uh, this team doesn't have the right uh, five for this situation when they're they up don't 20. have the players to play <laughs> trash minutes. Like, like there's no n- no five you there, can put. There in. is no a teenager you can throw on the court to get some experience. There is no guy who could you could consider like the that twelfth man on the roster who sits at the end of the bench. They don't have that. They even the guys that don't make it to the twelve man roster on Euroleague nights, they are good. They can play. <laughs> the guy that played the least minutes, okay, Latinsak has played only one game for them in the Euroleague this season, but mm-hmm. the second to last minutes wise was Philip Petrushev. He's now sent to Cervena Zvezda and he yeah. will be starting there, probably, and playing probably. huge yeah. minutes. Mm. So yeah. So with so many players, uh, I think they will they will just get better with each day. And and this double week, they did what they were supposed to do: two wins out of two at home. Yeah, great opponents, but fifteen point five offensive rebounds in the two matches. That's just insane against Real Madrid. That's um, Milutino factor. Exactly. And against Real Madrid, they had plus seventeen field goal advantage. I know it's it's usual against Real Madrid because they don't really crash the glass. For them, it's one and done. But 17 field goal advantage. How can you expect to win a match like that if you're if you're the, mm. the somehow it team? was still close. Like somehow, let's say with three minutes left, Madrid still had the open window because they didn't capitalize on on yeah the, yeah, you know, yeah as, on as, the as I mentioned yeah, yeah. Uh, I have to say, uh, mention that funny incident where uh, Mustafa oh, Fall yeah. looked like a WWE <laughs> fighter. A- Andre the Giant. <laughs> yeah, Andre the Giant, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> WWE <Big> fighter. <laughs> uh, at, at one point, it looked like he he just um, went out of the shower and and saw a crowd of people and he was just <laughs> holding his towel like this, like no no don't look. <laughs> it was funny. There's uh, fifteen thousand people watching. And you. there was Villar Gomez laying on the ground with. Uh, uh, part of Mustafa <laughs> Fall's jersey in yeah, his yeah. hand. <laughs> it definitely looked like WWE. <laughs> he, he, he about to sell it like in 15 years. This is a piece of shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I said it. I'm, I'm selling sa- it for one 10,000 euros. I, I said know. it on, on television that this part of the shirt that's left uh, the, the jersey, uh, Mustafa Fall could sell it on eBay. Uh, I think Olympiacos fans like an would, auction. Would pay money for this <laughs> souvenir. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, there was a, I don't know if you wanted to touch on that. There was this... Uh, yes. Uh, if you you're talking about okay. Bartokas, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. After the win uh, against Real, he went to the press conference and one of the journalists asked about the doubters, the haters or so uh, about uh, Bartokas specifically that there are people doubting his competency to lead this team to the title let's say uh, of course it came after a few losses before let's say the the greek derby was a loss as well and we can remember that although olympiakos made the final force in these past few years they haven't won one and the roster they have this year you probably have the goals to win the Euroleague for sure with the roster they have, right? So do you guys see any merit for a uh, change there? Because Bartokas thinks that maybe people got, uh, you know, like t- uh, grow, grew old or how, how do you say, like got tired of the same old faces in the team. Maybe they want changes, even though the changes might not bring the desired results. Do you think there is a need to change uh, Bartokas and his system in Olympia. Absolutely not. Absolutely, Absolutely not. not. And his system is so specific. Uh, the way they build the roster for him is so specific that I can only see a coaching change in the off season. Mm. A coaching change during With the, the roster season. Overhaul, uh, right. it, it wouldn't make any sense. Like 
there is no other club right now that's running things the way Olympiacos are. Uh, it it kind of was like that with Pablo Lasso and Real Madrid. Uh, I I don't see any reason for for people to doubt Barzokas right now. Like you lose a couple of games in regular season and there's reactions uh, to this. Like we need to change the head coach. I mean, it's it's insane. It's insane what we're talking about. Like I I'm not even sure why why we're discussing this. The patience is number one thing that's annoying me, coming from mm. fans' perspective. Like the, lack the, the, the lack of patience. The lack of patience. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. just the <laughs> exactly. So it's the number one thing because you lose one game and you immediately get like questions in the press conference uh, about you not doing a good enough job and and you know Andrea Trinkieri says it right. I I as a coach have to see the big picture. And I think Bartzaka sees the big picture. Although I had some discussions with uh, some basketball people about this, that Bartzaka's system elevates his players, makes it easy for his players to actually play great basketball. Sometimes you get stuck playing that because it's just... If, if the opposing team is focused enough for 38 min- minutes or they're like switching everything, they have the certain personnel, you will have difficulties. And Olympiacos sometimes sees that during the playoffs or in the Final Four when you need to win one game. Like, his system, I think, at the same time empowers players, but at the same time sometimes limits them in the games where you need more, let's say, randomness. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. That's what we saw last year, for example. I think in certain games. Well, last year they, yeah. they lacked guards they lacked that could guards. actually improvise. Mm-hmm. And, so and so do that's that stuff. why that's why I'm super high on them this season because they have actually improved in that. And even let's say Evan Fournier does not play very well during the regular season, that's hypothetical. I'm not saying he's not playing well. Or like Tyler Dorsey is not getting a lot of minutes. But in the playoffs, I think they could be huge to actually help with that randomness factor because, as I mentioned, that system is helping most of the time, but sometimes I think it's, it, it is kind of a little factor, but you are not going to fire Bartzokas for that no, reason. No, no way. That's like the results you are there. You hired him to do this stuff, so obviously exactly. you need patience. From player's perspective, uh, the only thing that is super important is you have to be willing to make sacrifices. Uh, like you might think about yourself as one of the top players in the EuroLeague in your position, and you could start thinking, on that team, I would be getting more shots, more minutes, a bigger role every night, every week. And here, one game I play 10 minutes, the other game I play 15. And basically, I know when I will enter the court, I know when I will be subbed out, I know when I will come back. Uh, So it's just that you need to be ready to sacrifice something and Alex, Alec Peters is the perfect example. And nobody seems unhappy or frustrated because mm. they realize they're in here to win championships. That's one thing. The other thing is that um, Olympia Cos is in a position to offer you a solid and sometimes even long-term contract. Therefore, you don't have to think about the future too much. Uh, I think on the roster right now, there's only one or two players with uh, one year left mm. on the contract. So you kind of feel safe from that perspective. And therefore, it's not an issue for you to, let's say, play less minutes sometimes yeah. and have less shots than you would on, on some other teams. Whoa, guys. When did you change your clothes? What the hell? Like this. Yeah. Halloween costume. Very nice. H- Hayes that? Davis, are you going to scare all the Berlin fans? <laughs> 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 Trick or treat? And uh, this is a ref- referees. Uh, oh yeah, because the three because you know I support the refs all the time. <laughs> three free throws, six free throws for you. Should, uh, uh, during the shooting motion, right? Oh yeah, my favorite one. Someone uh, shooting from half court, and I see the free fingers. Man, I love it. I feel devotion. Just do that. <laughs> Just do this. Uh, man. We have a sale. We have a Black Friday sale on Basket News. Uh, shop shop.basketnews.com is the website. There are up to 40% discounts on our merch, including the Nigel Hayes Davis uh, inspired merchandise. Also, the referees uh, calling a shooting foul inspired merchandise and many more. 
check everything out at shop.baskinews.com. The sale is up for now and it's going to stop at some point. So you you got to hurry. Got to hurry and get that merch. Get Early that Christmas merch. gifts. Early Christmas gifts is a smart way to go. Take care of business in November. Yep. Be safe in December. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was confused about Tyler Dorsey actually coming back to this team and now seeing how many minutes he gets or how infrequent he gets to play because he had some problems last year with uh, the other team with Fenerbahce, right? And uh, tweeting out uh, publicly that he's not happy with mm. the coaching staff, let, let's assume. Um, weren't you guys like questioning this a little bit or like wasn't that was that not about the time he was getting in Fenerbahce was that about but other uh, that I think that comes back to the thing that Reed has mentioned he was on an expiring contract so you kind of have to play good you have to g have better stats to sign a better deal mm. now this season I don't think he signed a one-year deal I think uh, it's at least oh so you thought it's more about that he can't show off it his could be or game he game. signed a three-year deal right now yeah. like so, you're, you're secured yeah. you're secured okay maybe uh, sometimes you could feel a bit frustrated like uh, for sure uh, there's an example the game in istanbul against fs he was scoring in the first half i don't remember exactly how many points he scored he maybe 10 or 12 points in the first half and then he doesn't play in the second <laughs> <laughs> well maybe it does not make sense But that's Barzokas. That's the way they play in the regular season. Mm. Um, nothing new. Uh, you can almost sometimes, before the game, if you're preparing to watch Olympiakos or, or to commentate, uh, you can actually mark the minutes when, when Wazenkov will sit on the bench, when he, he'll come back, and at what point of the first yeah. quarter he will be back to close the game. It's easy. It's simple. Everybody knows that, but it works. Yeah, I think also uh, now to come back to the Bartzokas uh, getting fired topic, the hypothetical <laughs> bullshit. Uh, Sounds I think crazy. What, no. what could be pushing out uh, this idea is another uh, great up and coming coach that is available. I don't know if you heard this guy uh, called Vasilis Panulis. Yeah, yeah, he's he's. Uh, I think he played for Olympiakos a little bit. And not uh, really. I I just started following Euroleague. I remember him soon. playing for the Houston Rockets. I don't know uh, nothing about well, his European career. Actually, he played for Panikos. I think even longer. <laughs> maybe I don't. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think uh, maybe some people are like, well, uh, you know, Spanulis is uh, looking like a very promising coach with a great tactician great place he's running maybe you know that's i feel like because that's the narrative that he's the next olympiakos coach but when is he, he gonna he be the could next coach be, but as i said an off-season coaching change could make sense if at some point barsakas maybe feels too tired for this job you could actually compare his uh, work with olympiakos to let's say jurgen klopp in, in liverpool like at some point you mm -hmm. are worn out you're out of energy and you might step down but that would happen in the off season not For a sure. like mid-season coaching change or anything like that well, do, do you think uh, what if they don't win the championship but make the final four you, you would keep bertzokas right uh I, I i cannot base my answer only on results i want to know the context mm. how they got there Uh, what problems they had, injuries, how they played, how close they were to winning, let's say, a semifinal or a yeah, final. how they lost. Like, okay, I, okay. I, I don't want to say just like, if they reach this result, I keep Barzokas. If they don't reach this well, result, that's the I, I that's fire. The thing that it's like in you know, Europe, it's all that matters sometimes. But it's yeah, the at the same time, are you firing Andrea Trinkieri because he lost uh, Lithuanian league last year? against Ritas after the Kino That would be the three. dumbest decision ever in Lithuanian basketball history and we <laughs> had some dumb decisions. <laughs> Let's actually move to some Let's Lithuanian basketball move, now. Yeah. Uh, there were some fireworks in Konas uh, this week uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday, Wednesday, I think. Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday. They're playing yeah. now, the second game. Yes. Uh, bit of a thriller of a game, first of all. Didn't expect it to go uh, to... A bit? I did, a bit, of a, a bit yeah, <laughs> a bit of a thriller, uh, ending with thriller. obviously Brian Dunstan <laughs> with that shot. What did you guys think about that play? Maybe you're the Brad play, play expert. Uh, Brad do you Stevens. think? Do you think they caught uh, Zvezdov guard as, as well as they did me? Because I wasn't thinking, you know, Brian Dunstan lob and then he gets a shot. But look, every away. time there is like one second remaining, you probably are going to have a back screen and then one of the shooter like. It's never one option. 
It's never like the guy is running out and for a catch and shoot three. It's always at least two options. And usually you set the back screen to get to try to see maybe if there is a lob. And then the same guy that set the back screen, he goes up top. Yeah. And if you watch the replay, Dovidas Gedraitis was even more wide open on the three point line than uh, Dunstan under the basket. And Ulanovos chose the riskier pass because it was the first option I think that he saw because Gedraitis was l later running up. And that pass was uh, got through. Dunstan made a shot, and I thought it was a epic play from Andrea Trinchieri. Amazing execution by Jalgiris. Not one back screen, but two back mm. screens. One was made by Francisco, and for sure, Cervena Zvezda does not want to help off of him because of what he's done in the game before. And um, it looked really similar to the play that Jalgiris got in Game Four of Lithuanian League Finals where Lukas Lekavic was, they actually started in this similar line. He just ran around the circle and Lukas got a wide open shot to actually force game five. But he missed. Nobody remembers that play anymore. Mm. And now it's a similar one, but just, you know, he's not going around, but setting the back screen. So I thought it was a super nice, uh, super nice wrinkle to the similar play and it worked and... Although the clock did not start uh, at the right time, the right time, it's still uh, the, the the shot was valid. Like like the zero point three, I think it yeah. was. Uh, late. That's something. That's something we should actually. Uh, put I still want to say that. Yeah, you said Brad Stevens five yeah, times. Yeah, Brad Stevens play. To expand and, on that. Brad Stevens play. He did uh -huh. it with Boston, not once. Actually, against against Trinchieri in a series, Olympia Milano, Bayern Munich. Messina won the game with similar play, which was a lob to Kyle Hines. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, to Zach Levy. Zach, Le Zach Levy. Zach Levy. Zach Levy. Okay. I thought it was Kyle Hines. But in, Mil in Milano. It doesn't matter. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the game was in Milan, yeah. And it was the quarterfinal series. So, you know, these things happen, but Milan I don't know I don't know if players? Brad Stevens invented the play. Maybe there were people doing it even before because there were laps to Dwight Howard when Stan Van Gundy was was mm. coaching Orlando Magic, but it is a Brad Stevens play because he was using it uh, when he was coaching the Boston Celtics. So that's all I wanted to say about the last play. And I want to ask you for some water because that vitamin drink really... Okay. Um, I, I, I what can we do? We, we, we can you do just pour me in some of yours? Or <laughs> okay, I can go, no, no, okay. and you can discuss okay. <laughs> the rest of the game, man. Just share the water. Very uh, sharing wow. is caring. Sharing is caring. All Thanks, right. Um, Thanks, what I was gonna say about the time, because I saw a lot of uh, reactions on Twitter, on every social media, pretty much, uh, with Serbian saying that you know the the clock was started late but if you actually watch the broadcast uh, where the referees go to the instant replay system and they speak with the timekeeper or with the guy doing mm -hmm. the replays uh, they said we see that the time was uh, started late how late was it started because we need to know and the guy says 0.3 seconds late so if you do the math, I don't remember exactly what uh, was the time where uh, Dunstan's uh, fingers didn't touch the ball anymore. But 0 I think 0 0.5, 0 0.4. 0 0.5, 0 0.4, something like that. It's still, if you do the maths, 0.2 seconds or 0.1 second left to the to the game. So it's, it's still valid basket, like mm -hmm. you said. So that's something that needs to be said. Otherwise, other plays that uh, were uh, questioned... I think we shouldn't discuss uh, because we're not experts in this, but uh, we probably have our own opinions. There were definitely some mistakes that were pointed out in the Give mm -hmm. Me Control episode. Uh, Donatus and uh, Todd Warning did. I think that's what my recommendation would be, to go and check that out. For I sure. Saw a, a lot so you don't that. want to admit that there was a robbery? No, I, I, I just... Uh, don't you think that Mafia robbed Zvezda? I think there were bad calls, it's including, grace. including the elbow to the face. So Mafia robbed poor Cervena Zvezda. That's, that's what you're yeah, saying. Like, like always, every loss for Cervena Zvezda is... Every uh, single week, robbery after robbery, man. Mm -hmm. But actually, I just wanted to say for people who are commenta uh, commenting on the Give Me Control episode or on the public part that we're scamming them, that we're uh, <laughs> basically... Uh, Teasing them. Basically, we wasted their life. Please understand, 
we're not doing this as a hobby and this is a job and uh, people need to get paid. So this is a support that you're showing with BM Plus, <laughs> becoming a BM Plus member and people who are in our community understand that. I just wanted to say it's ridiculous reading these comments. Oh, you're clickbaiting us. We're just giving you a preview of some additional content that we do. If you don't like it, like you don't buy it, but if you like it, you buy it and that's it. It's just- They you know, already been robbed and now we want to rob their money as well. 290 a, a month for a lot of extra content, Tritis, come on. Hey, Git is just for, for those people who want everything free, you know, just ask them to work for free for the next month. <laughs> that's what, <laughs> that's what, what I would like to That's ask, basically yeah. what they're saying. So. And, uh, and Mantas, our uh, camera operator, maybe we are not paying you for this month because uh, the guy said that we're robbing yeah, you're them. You're still so. having fun yeah, here, it's right? <laughs> it's a scam anyway. Bro. He's having fun here. He seems so happy. Uh, anyway. One more thing I wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you about the ending of the game. Right. Because you were, right, 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 you were right. commentating. You were in yeah. the arena. Yes. I was actually at that time busy with Dutch Klassiker and afterwards Partizan Monaco. I didn't see the game. I just saw the, the ending you of the, the game. saw the replay the next day. Uh, but not the full replay, actually. I okay. just saw mm -hmm. a bit of the first half when Ralgiris was good. And I just saw the ending, the ending mm -hmm. sequence. So how mad were you on air? When they didn't foul Cody, they didn't foul Plavšić. <laughs> Trinkieri was just pushing, oh smiling. You can't even push, smiling. It's actually like <laughs> did, did, what was uh, your reaction uh, to that? Because to me, it, uh, it's it's like some look. sort of a brain freeze. What happened over there? You know, it's one of those situations where you can't actually say uh, on it's national TV. You, I can't actually <laughs> sell my emotions <laughs> off most of the time. <laughs> but I was like. I was questioning why Smilagic did not foul Cody Miller. Yeah, and Plavšić had the ball in his hands for yeah, almost yeah. a second. Uh, Dunstan was uh, in a position to foul. Whatever, whatever, bro. <laughs> it was a crazy play. I was just happy that Brian Dunstan made the shot, so Alan Smilagic is still alive on on walking <laughs> on this planet Earth because but Dunstan <laughs> is also responsible in that. As I That's said, true. like of course, uh, all eyes are on Smilagic because he's guarding the ball handler Cody. and he he can foul him. There's multiple occasions where he could foul him, but Cody dished the ball to Plavšić. So once Plavšić mm -hmm. had the ball in his hands, Dunstan could easily foul him, reach in, get the foul, and you want Plavšić on the line actually. Mm -hmm. That would be good for Ralingris in that but situation. It was interesting because Smilagic was the last sub to get in for that last uh, defensive possession. He was and subbed in to, to defend in that possession. Like. And I, I thought it was, I did not know, like I, I maybe asked them today, like when I see, but uh, was it like a decision to put him on Cody Miller McIntyre or was just Allen so late to be subbed in and there was like no time because the, all the players are everywhere around the court. So no, it's not it like was, you're going to go 20 meters to take some different guy, you know? I think I think it was intentional because when I listened to the press conference, Trinkieri was asked this question, why was uh, why was specifically smiling on, on Cody? And he said, sometimes you got to try things and then find ah, out okay. they didn't work. So yeah. that was the idea. Fair enough. Um, in terms Do you want to talk about press conference? Or the oh, game. The, the, the lack of uh, press conference from the... No, I want to talk about the, the game, actually. Okay. So, actually, there were a few other things we haven't mentioned. There was a protest in the middle of the game, right? By uh, the uh, Sveropolis, by, by Serena Zvezda's coach. I didn't know that was possible, but apparently that's how you're supposed to do it. Just a little bit of a problem. Everyone is waiting for, what? what is it, six minutes? Everyone had to wait for Yanis uh, like Foropoulos to write the documents. The protocol. I mean, I understand if you're not... Uh, I just think it's not about uh, the coach or because I think uh, even Todd Warnick said that this is the right procedure to do. You have to protest as soon as possible or something. Yeah. But I think it's a EuroLeague problem not to have it like you protest if you really want to protest, you do it after the game, <laughs> not during the game. It was just a bit ridiculous what happened there. I, I guess we all found out that, you know, you can actually do it yeah. during the game because I've never seen that. And uh, I hope I'm not going to see it again mm. because it was just <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> like everybody just standing and waiting for for uh, the coach to sign a, a protest, which we all know is not going to actually do anything. So it was like, okay, you just, you're showing you're not happy with that call. Uh, it's your right. Uh, on Kalinic. You have the it's right to do so. Right, but it's just like, it, it, it was weird. There uh, are so many uh, 
possibilities to stop the game without using a timeout, and apparently we're finding out even new ones. Uh, funny thing is that, again, when I was watching yesterday the old NBA Finals game, the, the game was stopped because somebody was bleeding from the finger, and Jeff Van Gundy said, this is the right way to save your timeouts. Just give one of your players a small razor, <laughs> he cuts his finger, he's bleeding, the game stopped for a minute. Hey, <laughs> Jason Kidd is the goat at this, <laughs> you know? The spillage. <laughs> I think but, uh, he invented the legendary a couple more. spillage. Anyway, before, before we get, get into the details of the game, Rita, so I just wanted to say, did you know that your prediction is still alive? <laughs> I know that, I know. How hey. do you feel about that? You've that you boiled enough basketballs to actually make good predictions. Well, Congrats, there's bro. still that game against Pantanecos. Uh, and honestly, my prediction was based on something else because I thought Barcelona is the team they're going to beat, not Fenerbahce away. But it's it's still the statement was yeah. they're going to win one out of so the next paid, five. So you paid the referees so that your prediction no, stays. No, so right? like Ostoya paid me directly. I paid uh, the refs. Okay, gotcha. I paid through Paulus Motiunas, and and you know the transactions okay. Okay. reached the mm. the right people and things worked out. But honestly. I, I don't care about my prediction. I don't care if I'm right or wrong. However, it turns out, like they were this close to beating Barcelona, they were this close to beating Jalgiris and Konas, even though they were catching them and mm. like they needed a comeback in the second half. Jalgiris was leading for basically the whole game, ninety percent of the game. Mm. Uh, but they were so close to at least getting one win out of these two two yeah. games. So I mean, it's not like. Guys, I proved you wrong. I proved them right. You only, you're only winning one out of five. My point was never that they're a bad team or that they're playing bad basketball. At the time when I made a prediction, I haven't even seen a full game of Zvezda. Eventually, I saw one when they played Barcelona. Uh, so look, now they are adding players because they were unlucky to lose Joel Bolomboy. Maybe with a healthy Bolomboy, mm -hmm. at least one of those losses oh, wouldn't for happen. Sure. For sure. uh, so now they're adding players. Uh, they already signed Petrusha on a loan deal. They're probably gonna sign another big. There were so many rumors about Bismarck Biombo. Now there's rumors about Jonathan Motley. Let's just wait and see. So like, even if my prediction turns out right, it's not that I have an agenda <laughs> against Serena Vesda or that I care about it too much. It's just that it's one of the topics we, we, we were discussing on the podcast and I, I just yeah. delivered a mm -hmm. bold prediction. That's it. We'll, we'll get anyway. back to, to this. Vesda, but what did you guys learn about Jalgiris from this game? Anything new or same same what we've seen so far? I, I asked just, him. I didn't see the game. I just learned that Luan Francisco is one of the best players in the EuroLeague. And, uh, okay. No, I, I even did, after I that, didn't, uh, I didn't rougher... learn that. I didn't learn that. <laughs> let me rem reinforced. Re let me <laughs> the, rephrase the, that. Yeah. I just saw another proof mm. that he's one of the best players in the EuroLeague. And uh, what I again saw for one more, one more time from Andrea Trinquere and Charlie Griscona's uh, coaching staff is that they have every answer. Zvezda were switching a lot in the first half. So they went with one lineup like Lourinas Birutis was not even playing. And uh, but they were doing okay. Then Cervena Zvezda had a great second half. They switched up the defense. They played Uros Plavsic way more. They played. They sent two guys on Silvan Francisco. Now Andrea Trinchieri puts Lorinas Birutis in there. He makes some of the shots. Uh, he makes an impact. Silvan Francisco just kills whatever defense you are throwing in front of him. Like basically, first half switching defense, no problem. Second half hedging defense, like two players on him. He split that two two man uh, wall like three times easily. And then in the end, they were even doubling him. And the guy, for a couple of times, did not even pass the ball. Like, he's like, he sees two people against him, and he's like, hmm, yeah, maybe, yeah. I, maybe I can still <laughs> beat them with my speed. Like, one against two, why not? And for one time in the end, he did He did that. Plavšić made a mistake defensively, and let me say it again, He Plavšić played a great game. Like, Amazingly, probably although he was attacked the whole time. Yeah, def defensively not that great, but offensively he basically kept Zvezda right mm -hmm. in there with his offensive rebounds just being so tall, and I think that's the way to actually hurt Chalgiris for other teams like crashing the glass. But um, Chalgiris is is just doing what they needed to do at the start of the season, and Silvan Francisco is amazing. In the third quarter, Chalgiris scored 19. 
and he created 17 points of those. He -hmm. had nine points and four assists. So 17 points out of 19. That's just amazing. And to me, uh, I expected him to be great, but I did not expect him to be that unstoppable so quickly. Wow, just... Yeah, and it wasn't even a perfect game from him. He missed, I think, a lot of three-pointers. I'm looking at He started out. with uh, two turnovers. Drag Race had mm-hmm. three turnovers, I think, in the in the first or two quarters. I'm not sure about now. But he, he was basically responsible for the two turnovers of the three to start. And then he was just unstoppable later. Yep. But yep. Uh, at the same time, those referees' mistakes and, you know, once again, a recommendation to watch the full episode of Give Me Control because... Stop scamming, bro. Yeah, my bad. But Todd actually says that there was mistakes on both sides. And where I'm going with this, yes, the mistake with the elbow was probably mm, the most obvious one. And it had a big impact because when you think about yeah. it, it was a, a M1. So the two points counted, plus then Smilogic misses the free throw. And then uh, I think he just put the back. Uh, he grabs the, the ball, ball back and in. dunks it. Yeah. So it was a huge momentum points. changer because Vesda was coming back into the game and that kind of stopped it. But at the same time, like ne- Nemanja Nedovic, where it was the jump ball situation, he traveled. Yeah, uh, European rules say travel, American rules yeah. would say uh, jump ball. Other, you know, clips that Todd emphasized in his video, like in favor of Zvezda. So not all the mistakes like Zvezda fans think were made in in in, uh, in, in Jager's favor. Like I said favor. in the beginning, like exactly. I said in the beginning, uh, everyone sees only one side of the... Because they lost the game. But what I wanted to say... <sighs> but it's all like... Yanis Ferropoulos walking out of that press conference why you can't answer questions you don't want to get in trouble i mean you know so, you look, don't want to get fined for bashing the referees that's all you want to say really probably you're saving yourself but are you not going to get fined for not answering questions no i or don't does think he so. need to only to show up i don't know i, I don't think he really puts so uh, much uh, <laughs> emphasis on those things. when we go out and for they, they don't care when we go out for uh trips uh I don't know. Get some I think there are, there are press conferences in EuroLeague anything. where coaches are willing to answer questions, but they just don't get any. But just keep it classy. Like, ah, man, come on. Keep it classy. Look, some of those coaches, they have big egos. They, they When yeah, they're yeah, angry, sure. you, you could see that. Uh, I mean, if a person is signing a protest protocol during the game, do you really expect to see him in the press conference answering questions? Yeah. If they won, then maybe, yes, he could talk about these things with a straight face, you know, being proud of his team winning the game. Now they lost, so yeah, you're frustrated. Uh, Again, uh, look, I'm not in a business. I'm not coaching a team or anything like that. I can just imagine myself in in these positions, but those meltdowns that happen, the way the fans react to their, their teams losing, to the referees making mistakes, it... Just it's it's just like ridiculous. Even like, yesterday, yeah. if you remember the first half of that Olympia Cause game, there were so many calls where everyone on Olympia Cause team was just grabbing their heads. Um, All the we're fans making were- a circus out of our game. Like uh, people are calling NBA circus because of how they play. I would call our game circus because of how people react to referee blowing his whistle. The fans are so sensitive. Like. We're talking about grown-ups, 30-year-old people. Usually, like, a stereotypical Serbian basketball fan is a really strong, masculine male in his 30s. And you're that sensitive as you're going to go on the socials to cry about referees making mistakes. You're going to send DMs to random Lithuanian people that actually have nothing to do with the game. Come on, and man. then it becomes the, this complaining, and the players complain, and the coaches complain. Like Ralgiris may be benefited from some of those mistakes, but there will be a game where Ralgiris will suffer. There were a lot of games where Ralgiris suffered from missed calls, bad calls. I remember when Sharas was coaching, he was talking about that, respect, respected, respect. Yeah, yeah, like I don't see Lithuanian people <laughs> reacting. <laughs> that sensitive to those situations. Eh, you maybe don't wi- visit uh, Jargiris Arena and you would hear some, but but it's not on the level where you go on social media, right? Comments. Threatening like, people, like yeah. attacking the EuroLeague page. Okay, m- maybe I, I can remember examples where Lithuanians actually did that. Uh, maybe I shouldn't uh, shouldn't say that Lithuanian fans are better than than 
other fans from it's other like countries. A, no, it's, it's not about it's not about that. It's, it's about the sensitivity, I would say. It's I don't. I just, I just cannot understand how I a basketball devotion. result can impact your life as much as this. Like, I support certain teams, certain but players. If, if, if people didn't feel like that, we would have uh, NBA kind of atmospheres. You cool. Know? So, I would so love it, that. So it's. Uh, I would love that. Okay. No. I, I wouldn't, no we, I wouldn't. I, wouldn't. I support <laughs> certain we teams, have that cer- certain players. When they lose, when something goes wrong, I feel frustrated. I feel frustrated, sometimes sad, for an hour. Not for the whole week. Yeah, that's A basketball true. result doesn't change my life at all. I mean, I, I cannot but understand. It's, like, it's obviously people, different people have different uh, sensitivity it's levels. It's not healthy for you to attach of, yourself of course, to a sports team as much as it becomes one. a part of your life. And you cannot accept the of losses. Course it is. Like, of course it isn't. But that's not Fucking what, uh, hell, man. I'm sorry for this. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I agree with you about this. Like, this is a pure ego, like... Uh, attachment to a team. If you're a teenager, that's fine. When I was a teenager, I would cry when Jalgiris would lose. I, when they lost to Maccabi in 2004, I didn't want to go out f- for two weeks. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to sleep. I didn't want to do nothing. It felt like that's it. That's the end of the world. Jalgiris is not in the final four. But, but Ritas, if everyone was I was so a teenager. Ne- but if everyone was so neutral as you are right now, for example, we wouldn't, like I say, we wouldn't have this passionate fan base who make a great uh, feature of the EuroLeague that you we, can support your so, team wait I, I think at least you, you need to be devoted like no re, like but it's a religion look, but just understand two things you can be passionate and you still can be not as sensitive as they are right now mm. like if your team in the EuroLeague uses and we're not talking about I'm not talking about Tervena Zvezda only Half of the teams, if their team l- loses the game, it's the refs and Euroleague Mafia. Yep. It's not your team that actually sucked for like 20 minutes during the game. No, it's, it's always, not the other team that it's played mafia, well. Mafia and the refs is always the same. Because in this game, Jalgiris played great for most of the time and Zvezda played great for two quarters. And then you are saying that it's... So half and half. Yeah, no, no. no not half and half. You're, you're just saying that... Uh, said the uh, Euroleague Mafia. Are, yeah, no, One no, call no. decided everything. Right? Yeah, no, no Jalgiris played g- great for like for th- almost th- 30, yeah, 30, yeah. 30, 32 minutes. No, and what you said, man, it's, it's like, good, I don't care. I mean, I don't watch the games for the fans. I don't watch it on television to feel some atmosphere. I watch it not, I don't watch it for the refs. I don't analyze refs when I watch games. I watch it for the players. I understand. Uh, but I'm saying what makes Euroleague great is those atmospheres in my eyes. Because I think the players and coaches make the Euroleague great. Also, but it's a big, big asset of, of Euroleague because otherwise we're just looking at a lower level talent playing basketball. Okay, maybe people on socials are not necessarily all the fans that support the team. For sure not. In, in and, and usually some of them are just Twitter trolls. And and don't forget, yeah, the, the ones who actually make comments uh, on social media yeah. or anywhere, they're the ones who are the most miserable in their life to to have time yeah. to do this because other people but just, you know, understand that. Man, they're calling me a Nazi. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, that makes no sense. People really. in Lithuania label <laughs> me as a liberal leftist. Yeah. And then there's people in Serbia calling me a Nazi. What am I? Well... No, we're Who getting... are you? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> um, just to finish up with Sirvena Zvezda, I, I wanted to say uh, Nedovic was back, obviously, from uh, missing one game. Now Petrushev made his debut. You guys heard about the Jonathan Motley rumors. You think they need another big or they would do well with just Petrushev? In there? I don't know the timetable for Bolomboy, but Bolomboy... It's not much. It's not that long. Bolomboy is a months, different maybe? player. Well, if you sign Motley, when Bolomboy gets healthy... Then you don't play Plavšić anymore, right? Now he's getting a lot of maybe. minutes. Well, Petrushev can play as a four. You have Mitrovic, you have Kalinic. No, if, the you, se- sign, if you sign Motley... The season is long. Yeah, the season is long and they have a really... Depth is, 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 would be crazy and... With their uh, offensive limitations, let's say in the backcourt, uh, Motley offensively would make sense mm. because you know you have Cody, you have Isaiah Kanan, you have Kalinic, who's uh, they all have limitations offensively. 
And, uh, you know, adding Motley, who can just put the ball in the hoop quite easily, would be, would be a nice addition. By the way, guys, do you know Kalinic's percentage from three points? No, uh, no in, idea. In the season? No idea. You can guess. Uh, is it high or low? Because I'm, I'm not sure which... Just guess. Uh, Nikola uh, Kalinic. I, I, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm going to guess. Three, All right. So I'll, I'll uh, go 60%. I'll go the other way. I'll say 12 57. 57. Okay, so I, was I only there. saw one game again. I sorry. Only yeah. three sorry. I only saw one game against far. Barcelona. I didn't look at the stats. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. 57% yeah. and he's just punishing for every yeah. defensive risk that they're from. I yeah. remember him when, when he played for Jelko in Fenerbahce. There were days when he would turn to Stojakovic. <laughs> From Kalinic just for s- oh, oh no, never mind. Just for some reason. Joke. Just for some reason. Even in the final four. When they they became champions, all the spot up shots went in. He's actually shooting better from the three point range than the two point range in this season, fifty two, fifty seven, mm. <laughs> and better than free throws, fifty three percent as well. So, so it's a, a bit of an anomaly, let's say. Um, also, after this game, there was some news that dropped uh, out of nowhere, let's say, right Crazy. on our heads from Jalgiris Cam. Quite big news and quite surprising news, in my opinion, because of how uh, we were thinking that at least there were rumors that Real Madrid was very interested and nego- in negotiations with Lonnie Walker Jr. Or not Jr., sorry, the fourth. So that's uh, four <laughs> times uh, Jr. Like Wade Baldwin. Yeah, like Wade Baldwin, the fourth, yeah. Uh, Lonnie Walker, the fourth. Uh, d- did you guys think Schalgeris needed this signing? And actually, we'll talk about the best signing transfer of October. But let's start with Lonnie. It's a big name coming to the EuroLeague. Uh, in in your your league standards, let's say, D- did you think that they needed him? Because my my thinking was, don't fix what isn't broken. You no, know? but look, they started the season with Tyron Wallace, and once mm-hmm. he left, there, there's an open position, there's a vacancy, and people were maybe discussing that Chalgiris don't need a guard; they don't they need another big. But there was this opportunity to sign a legit NBA player who is for some reason out of contract right now he started the season the preseason with the boston celtics he got cut he didn't sign a deal in the nba he didn't want to play in the g league all of a sudden he's available in europe but there are certain conditions and i think those conditions led to him not signing with real madrid not maybe signing with other top clubs that could maybe even pay him more money or even though jargiris as I understand, will pay him a, mm-hmm. a decent salary. He could be the top earner on this this, around this roster. So they just used the opportunity. They probably didn't look at the positions where he plays. They just looked at the quality and what he brings to this team. And when you're now on the roll, you're starting the season five and one, uh, you're starting to probably dream big. And adding a player like Lonnie Walker is huge like the ceiling is so so high for him i wouldn't want to compare him with edmond sumner that jalgir has brought in during the last season Absolutely not. different players with different stories lonnie walker didn't have any serious injuries he was actually preparing for this season with the boston celtics he's healthy he's ready to play he's only 25 years old he had good seasons with a solid role on good nba teams it's not some fake stats playing for the detroit pistons or the charlotte hornets or Uh, any other team that's tanking at the moment. He played for Popovich in San Antonio. He played with LeBron in Los Angeles. He was a stable scorer off the bench, sometimes a starter, 10, 12 points per game, good spot-up shooter, good cutter, uh, physical player. He can play defense. I mean, he has it all. He has it all to be a superstar in the EuroLeague. I know Mm. that's probably not his goal, which is why we have this NBA buyout, yep. and and he probably wants to go back. But I mean, if he wants it, to go back it, to the NBA, he needs to be a superstar here. Yep, for Chargers <laughs> right now. Yeah. But eventually, like, let's take Kendrick Nunn for as sure. an example. Kendrick Nunn became a star in Athens. Maybe once he signed, once he arrived, his mindset was also, I'm going to get back play, as soon as possible. I'm going to prove how good I am right now. The NBA contract is the only thing on my mind, but eventually he's happy in Panathinaikos. He won, he's winning titles. Uh, people love him. They can offer him good money, and now he's, he's staying. So who knows? Maybe Lonnie Walker plays so good for Jalgiris, falls in love with EuroLeague, and next season we'll see him on one of the top clubs 
in Europe. But at the moment, definitely he wants to get back to the NBA and, and sign a guaranteed deal. And EuroLeague is a good platform for him to perform and, and deliver. And Jalgiris can give him the tools right now, mm-hmm. I think. Because Francisco needs help. It's it's not sustainable to put so much on his shoulders and to expect that it's going to carry out for the whole regular season. Uh, I know that somebody will suffer. Somebody will have less minutes. Uh, it's it's maybe a, an alarm clock for Brasdakis for some other players. Because in terms of potential, Lonnie Walker is the biggest signing that Jalgir has made for a long, long time. I, I'm not even sure since what Sonny I can Weems. say. Yes, yeah, since Sonny Weems, probably, yeah. And Ty Lawson was also there yeah, during for, the lockout course. season. Of course. Uh, to me, Lonnie Walker is the best signing of October, although he hasn't even played. Okay. Um, to, to Edmund Sumner, like, he, obviously I'm comparing the two Jalgeris signings, uh, Sumner and Walker, just because they are both in-season signings. And because they're both uh, coming from Nets. <laughs> they both uh, that that the, could be too, but to Nets. say that Lonnie is from the Nets, yeah, he played no, there no, last no. season, yeah. but he, his more important roles were in the pre- previous teams. Yes. And uh, it's just Europe is dominated by players who have skill, offensive skill. But for some reason, they can be in the NBA. A lot of these guys are just too short. TJ Shorts, Mike James, Shane Larkin, uh, Marcus Howard, you know, Carson Edwards, Shabazz Napier. Look at all these guys. Like, they have great skill. I think Lonnie Walker has enough skill and elite elite athleticism for for Europe. So he should be a way better signing than Edmund Sumner. But at the same time, will he be 15 point scorer immediately? I highly doubt it because it's it's a new team. It's a different style of play. It's a new coach. Uh, you, you just have to understand where you are. Just for the first time in his career, he's going to play abroad. He exactly. never lived abroad. Exactly. So it's going to so, be new experience for him in total. But as you mentioned, no serious injuries. I, I did some research. He had like d- d- uh, meniscus surgery twice uh, before. That sounds serious, but okay. No, you miss after like meniscus surgery, you miss like two months. Meniscus is kind of bad. Uh, it, it might catch up to you in the future, but when you're that young, you recover easily, and mm-hmm. it's not a ligament injury. It was, it's not ACL. It's not Achilles. Yeah. Exactly. It was pre- uh, previous NBA signing Sumner had Achilles injury. Moudier signed with Jalgiris after a year without basketball. Different, yeah. different, different situations. That, that's but, but why I'm so hyped about this. I, I will say my part about this. I would think like he won't be the Kendrick Nunn type of impact because I feel like it's a different space and system you have with the Panekos and Ataman system that they have. It's quite, quite a freedom-based, you know, space for you to to showcase your talent, like like we've been talking about, and for none to come over to Europe and have the ability to just take as many shots as you want, uh, rely on your talent, all that. And now we're talking about. Jalgiris, who's been rolling five and one teamwork. Okay, sometimes uh, Sylvain Francisco has to take it upon himself to decide those games. Maybe sometimes uh, we see uh, Verzdekis get the ball and, and then uh, keep no, it let's for, not for see, a while. Let's not see that. Uh, but that's what I'm saying. So, but generally speaking, I feel like it's much harder for for um, for Walker the fourth will be to mm. to adjust to this kind of a system, especially with Trinkeris in intense rotations. I mean. We see sometimes he, if he sees that uh, someone isn't uh, performing at that moment, he just subs them out, and you know it's it's just a part of the part of his game plan. Well, he wants the players who like Portsoka similarly, but not exactly. But also, he he doesn't necessarily uh, will give you the time mm. if you're if you have a status on the team or something. I get what you're saying, but at the same time, Trinkieri is so smart that if he'll see the potential of Lonnie Walker and, and he'll realize this guy can dominate Euroleague courts, he's going to let him run the show. I don't I don't think he'll he's going to limit him or limit his abilities. I remember how he was working with Wade Baldwin, let's say, in, in Bayern Munich. So if he shows that he's that good, yeah. I don't think the system will be the problem. Okay. That would I, limit I, I him. I agree with that uh, mm-hmm. Trincari is smart, is what and, I'm going to say. And the thing is, <laughs> the thing is with Lonnie Walker, 
he's not necessarily a ball handler. He can be a very eff- effective off-ball player. He's a good spot-up shooter. He's a good cutter. He's great in the open court. It, it's not that mm-hmm. he has to play all the pick and rolls and, and be the primary ball handler all the time. Like I don't compare him to Kendrick Nunn as basketball players because they're completely different. Mm-hmm. If you put position labels on them, like Nunn is one slash two and mm-hmm. Walker would be more two slash three. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's different. So that makes me think it, he's probably going to need some time to adjust, but it shouldn't take too long for him to showcase his abilities. Like his offensive play type, he watched that and uh, <clears throat> last season, but also before it was uh, around 20%, tw- between 20 and 25%, you have the catch and shoot. And then you have around 20 to 25 percent transition. So that's like 40 to 50 percent, like half of your game comes in situations where it's not. Others will create for you. Exactly. Like transition opportunities just just come to you, whether you sprint or you just uh, you you rely on your defense. And Charlie Grace has the number one defensive rating so far. And then catch and shoots, it's 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 up for others. But it's just about three. being in the let's, right position. Let's not forget where he was playing, uh, with what kind of talent he was playing of course, as well. So it's going to be. The, the I'm, I'm just saying, like ego, like might come in here, but we'll see. Like this is not. I'm not. Oh, no, it, I'm not saying uh, you know that it's not, not going to work out. But I'm just saying there should be just not like a hundred percent certainty that this is going to be like you said, uh, your October signing when we haven't seen him so far. Easily. But let's see, do you have any other name that you think uh, is the signing of October? We have uh, besides uh, Lonnie Walker, the Ford, Sabin Lee, Philip Petrushev was a transfer, but let's say it's a signing. Skylar Mays, Jordan Lloyd, any of these names? Hmm. Am I missing any? Well, since Sabin Lee dropped the dagger, and, Just and, and, game he, and, he, Real and, well, and his debut game was pretty impressive mm-hmm. against FS as well. Seems like a good signing, good replacement for Jordan Lloyd, because Lloyd doesn't even feel like a new signing for Monaco. Uh, it doesn't really have the the impact that Saban Lee has on Maccabi, but right? But still, you know, it's Jordan Lloyd coming back to his old team, and, yeah. and Petrushev is also coming back to his old team. Mm, so Skylar Mays. Skylar Mays. It's too games. early. It's too yeah. early. We we saw Saban Lee playing a bit more, and you know the system is not that strict uh, in Maccabi as it is in Fenerbahce. So, and Skylar Mays yeah. for me, I mean, this was a signing that was described as a man who will uh, complete tasks, and it's kind of like his game is that. Like it's not very spectacular to watch. It's very. Simple, like he doesn't have some crazy handles or anything. He cannot like ISO, uh, go in ISO and create some crazy shots as many others uh, in in that same team could. So it's like, I don't know, like how can you say he's the signing of the month? I'm going to wait. Like he he might not be the signing of October, but who knows, maybe in December we'll talk about him as a big impact player. So let's, let's just wait. So you're you're going with uh, Lonnie Walker. He hasn't Ford. even played yet, mm. and we're picking him. Yeah. It's just because of. I, I'm going with Saban Lee because because we've seen him. That's my pick. Yeah, that's also fair. But just Lonnie Walker is such a big name. Mm. Right now, looking at the standing so far, what is the the spookiest? <laughs> what, what's the, the spookiest uh, uh, anomaly that's uh, like you you can't believe what's happening? Let's say in the standings for Do me, have, okay. Bayern Munich is where I didn't expect them to be, and especially considering who they beat. Because that's where I, I looked at it this way, who these teams beat. If you look at Jalgiris, for example, we just said recently, they kind of beat the teams that we expected them to beat, right? Um, with uh, Bayern Munich, I did not expect them to beat, obviously, Real Madrid. I did oh, not gosh. expect them to beat Olympiacos. Maybe, okay, uh, Paris, yeah, and Virtus, you could expect, but 4-2, and two, I think, is, is something that for me is the biggest, I can't say that word, anomaly? Yeah, that's it. Anomaly, yes, yeah, a norm, yeah. normal word. I don't I don't know if Americans use that so much, but it's... That's what the not suggested a good word. for us. It's uh, a good a word. Topic. It's uh, a good uh, word. W- what about you guys? And I pick Paris basketball. I pick Paris, they're free and free, and the games they lost, those were really close games. So they could easily be in an even mm-hmm. better position. Uh, they lost a three-point game to Zvezda. They lost a two-point game to Bayern Munich, which was uh, an overtime game. Uh, they beat Milan. Oh, I'm sorry. They lost to Milan uh, also uh, away, and that was also a close game, five-point game. They were leading for most of the time. They beat Panathinaikos. They beat Monaco away, DJ Shorts, Masterclass. They beat Alba Berlin, which you could expect. 
but why I picked them is m- mostly based on the feeling about Paris basketball before the season and the opinions about them before the season started. Mm-hmm. Euroleague newcomers, Thiago Splitter doesn't have any experience as a head coach. I heard some colleagues even calling for uh, Thiago Splitter to be replaced really early and, and bringing Kasis <laughs> Moxvites, who was one of the candidates. But right now, they're just playing good basketball. Uh, it's they're just playing what they've been playing in the Euro <laughs> last year. It's a different coach. Some players left, but DJ Shorts is still there. It's clicking. Uh, they're fun to watch. The standings are okay so far, free and free. They should be more or less happy with the situation. They're facing Basconia at home. I don't see why they could not get the fourth win here. Uh, so yeah, that's I, that's, I, that's I why could, I picked them. I could I could add the same things about the team I mentioned. My, uh, Bayern Munich playing fast, bl- uh, very beautiful to watch. And uh, what about you? That picks? is also a good pick. I'm going with yeah. You both had great picks, but uh, Bayern Munich for sure. And uh, you mentioned fast. They have the number one uh, pace in the league, 74 possessions. Uh, Gordy Herbert, I was in love with his style of play with the German national team. And I'm seeing uh, a lot of things I like with the Bayern team. And the way just he empowered uh, Carson Edwards, who is scoring almost 30 points per game in his last three something like that, Shabazz Napier. Uh, I thought he could not be a great player anymore in the EuroLeague, but he has proven me and probably a lot of others wrong so far. Mm -hmm. And just, uh, it is really nice. It it, it was Paris and Bayern, both really fun teams to watch. Uh, So they're definitely the most surprising team to me, let's say, uh, in the beginning of the season. But we were very positive in, in these picks. What about teams like Real Madrid, uh, Milan, perhaps, Virtus? Mm. Did you expect uh, them to be here? Milan, Milan well, and Virtus, um, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> for Real sure, Madrid, yes. Yeah, Real Madrid not winning on the Our road Italian is, correspondent. is an interesting thing because Real Madrid, it, yeah. how they dropped the game yesterday. Uh, yeah, didn't expect them to be in this position right now, but we also kind of thought that Real Madrid doesn't look as strong as they did a year ago and maybe we didn't see them dominating the regular season as easily as they did in the past so yeah it's it's But you still see them in the final four at this point Real Madrid I'm I'm look, I'm there's concerned there's a long way final long four way it's, it's let's, let's just talk maybe about positions uh, in the regular season and we were talking with Rita's before the podcast like do you see them in the top 6 and I'm like they have a lot of problems and I don't know how to solve them, but at the same time, they're probably going to play better. They haven't won a game away. Yeah. And I remember saying about them like last season, like they're winning games because of their talent, because defensively they're making mistakes. They're not getting offensive rebounds. They're not, you know, they're not defending well that well. And offensively, they're just living on their talent, and they are amazing. Like com- what Campazzo has been doing uh, in the first month is just spectacular. All the other guys, but now, can you be a really successful team just with your offense? I think a you coaching, think going a to coaching be sure? change is possible. Uh, a roster change is also possible. You never know what's going to happen. You cannot look two months ahead of you, but. I still think they are a top six team and they should fight for the home court advantage in the playoffs. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, let's let's not get stuck here and move on to one of my favorite segments, which would be your EuroLeague All October team. Yeah. So I don't know. I did it by positions because I'm a, a conservative guy. I don't like to put the three guards in, into. I actually did put three guards. In there. <laughs> <laughs> I realized uh, my my one of my. Uh, I have three guards as well. Three okay, and two so it's hard guards. not to have three. Let's guards. Let's go at the one position, point guard. Who do you have? Oh, you go like this. Let, like, or, uh, or should we do? No, our let's fives. just let's, let's just have, say guard. Let's just say guards. Guards. Okay, guards. Yeah. guards. How many guards? So you have three each. I have three. I, I also have three. I let's have say three. them out loud. Okay. Three, two, one. Salam Francisco. No, I don't have Sil- no one in mind. You don't, have, you don't have a guy from the number one team in the league after one month who's creating mm. so many points there. 
13 points, six assists. I just don't see space for him with TJ Schwartz there. And I have some TJ Schwartz oh, as well. You're not building a team to play. You're just picking the best players. No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying based on performance. Fair. Well, I, I I thought uh, TJ Shorts had the bigger impact because some games Savan didn't perform as well as you keep he did, describing he, him. He played bad in one game. And he didn't. No, nah, you have a strong case for Savan. For you cannot go wrong with him. But I have just, him as MVP of the month. To be honest. Oh wow. <sighs> TJ Shorts for me. Okay. Other guards. But yeah, the the team winning is an important argument, and it's a strong case for Savan Francisco. But it's without just that, him, that team is. And without TJ Schwartz, Paris is uh, dead last, probably. But they are three and three right now. Hey man, you're picking f- from five or six uh, I know. good guards, and someone. Yeah, that's, be a, left that's out. a great discussion. <laughs> Someone's gonna be left out. Uh, Ralgis is number one seed. It's great. Uh, but wait, 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 wait. Paris without uh, TJ Schwartz is zero and six, right? I would say, yeah. yeah. Now they're three and three, so that's three wins. Jalgris are five and one, and without Francisco, they're probably one and five or zero and six. Nah, I don't think so. I would think they would beat that dead Maccabi team that was in Konas. I'd think they would beat at least one of the two Italian teams. Without Francisco? I think so, because these Italian teams are just... No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> they can lose to anybody. They were down 27, by the way. They can lose to anybody. Well, I know. Hey, uh, okay, whatever. TG well, Shorts. Whatever. Uh, okay. Okay. A lock. TG Shorts. TG Shorts, we all have. So you have Sylvan. Do you have Sylvan, Francisco? No, I don't. I have Kevin Punter. I have there. Kevin Punter. I have as KP well. as well. Because Kevin Punter, definitely, if you take away Kevin Punter from Barcelona, that offense. Well, like we Especially saw after La Provita was injured. Yeah, yeah. Injury. So that, yeah. yeah. But the uh, stat wise, the only game he didn't really play that well probably was against the beginning of the season, but then he's so consistent. He's, I mean, looking at his stats 18.6 points per game in only 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. Incredible percentages 62, 47, 2.4 assists, and less than one turnover per game. You Looking must good there. TJ so, Shorts, 18, 18 points, almost eight assists, most created points in the league. 23 PAR index rating for a guard yeah. at 175 to be effective as he is and to do it without shooting freeze. So it, ridiculous. Your three guards are Shorts, uh, Francisco, and uh, Bunter. Who's your third guard? Campaso. Okay. That's a good pick. I. I went. See, I rewarded win. I went uh, cool. <laughs> with someone taller because I was thinking about positions. Again, like you're idiot. thinking about how this team would yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. It uh, won't play, but man. I but they have uh, Okobo from Monaco because I feel like he performed mm, like surprisingly well, even though his shot selection still like you can have a lot of criticism about Eli Okobo. But so far, he's the leading scorer of that team, and he leads James. the team in the assist as well. And that yeah. plus, yeah. Although they don't like like we spoke about Monaco, it's okay. they don't really yeah. pass around the ball so much. But it, I feel like Eli Okobo <laughs> deserves. If we're doing it a monthly, you know, team mm. all 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 October team, I think Eli Okobo deserves for this month's performance and how Monaco looked so far. Their results. Well, it's I a nice pick, there. but if I had to pick between the two French players, I would go with Francisco. But it's it's a nice pick. Okay, then front I, court. I feel Lezenkov. like it's easy, right? Lezenkov. Lezenkov and Lazor. Yeah. God, Couldn't same. have it any other way. I mean, you could have a case for Tyreek Jones, but Partizan didn't win that many yeah. games. Yeah. And Lazor, 14 yeah, points, Lazor and seven Lezenkov. rebounds, three offensive L- rebounds, and shooting 81% from two. And, and let's be honest, they, they probably will be the two front runners for the MVP this season. That's the next topic we have, actually, the MVP ladder. So I did this, wish. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's, that's right. I have Sasha as my number one contender so far in the MVP ladder, and Matthias as a second close second what mm-hmm. do you guys do you have any other we have a top three so who? i think Campazzo could sneak into this race as soon as real madrid starts winning games consistently see guys you just went like the the usual names like well, after but the season isn't this the way it's it well, i remember i remember last league? year i remember last year we did this after the first month and and virtus are winning the games and tornika shingeli is playing <laughs> amazing basketball Did you give him the mvp then uh, after the month. first month, like MVP of the month, MVP of the month. The I M- thought this MVP is MVP ladder. ladder in terms of who's gonna win the MVP at the end of the season. No, we are not doing the predictions. We if are talking about. Well, the I'm, month. Not, month. I'm not predicting, but let's say M- NBA does the MVP ladder. So if for one month Pascal Siakam is the best player in his conference, it doesn't really the, put him on the ladder because ladder is also based 
a bit on the narrative. And you, the for odds sure, and, but yeah. but come on, like if uh, so, who's who's your MVP? Ladder? My MVP is Silvan co- Francisco for the month of October. Okay. I mean, why not? If they win, look, look, we're doing this on Friday before the game. Mm-hmm. If they win, they're alone at number one place. But this game is already on November, so it doesn't affect the October. Ah, ah, <laughs> okay, okay. That's true, that's but at the same time, then it's not fair. Some teams have played seven games oh, already. That's mm, whatever, whatever, whatever. 14 points almost, six assists, two turnovers. Percentages look okay. So mm. much creation from Jalgris. You know, they're five and one. And we're, if we're talking just only for one month, to yeah. me, he's the, he's the MVP. Just because Olympia Cost were three and three before yesterday. Uh, Pao, you know, Matias Lazor, 14 7. Kendrick Nunn, not, you know, great basketball, but I just rewarded winning in the first month. Nice, no, cool, man. I agree that he could be the MVP of the month. It's just that we looked at the MVP ladder concept mm-hmm. from a different angle. We're putting players that are realistic candidates for the regular season MVP race. So, and uh, based on what that, if Zalgiris, like finishes third? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, but, then but then let's talk about this after the new year, okay? How realistic it would look okay. and, and where Francisco would rank at that moment because this is just the first month of yearly mm-hmm. and realistically I'm still putting Vezenkov against Lasor in the race for the MVP and I'm throwing in Campazzo as someone who could okay. sneak in I don't think Mike James is as focused on the MVP this season anymore <laughs> and, and he's not going to be <laughs> yep. in the conversation yep. probably they just need to win that's the most important thing although and you shouldn't have said that before the game in Konas <laughs> I hope he does not hear this podcast. <laughs> I, I he think won't. he won't. He's going to uh, play a game today, and if he's listening to, to us before a game, then it's not good. Uh, Change your <laughs> routine, Mike. Another guy I will put in the <laughs> conversation, like you put Campasso there, I was put at third place, Kevin Punter, because of the team's results and because of how he's been playing. So that's why, that's uh, See, how I looked at it. This, that was my logic. You, you put someone like up... If mm. let's say before the season I didn't see Kevin Punter anywhere close the MVP ladder, now after uh, Barca was five and one, okay, they just lost, and uh, Punter is the top scorer, top uh, creator, basically the the yeah, yeah. the person that the offense is uh, like running. It, realistically, if Aswell wins today, they are three and four, but you wouldn't put Neil Sako as an MVP or Theo Maladon or Theo Maladon. Yeah. Anyways, guys, we've had quite a long podcast. We had uh, some nice categories to look at. We had planned some things like biggest loss or injury, but I think those are sad things. We should finish on a positive note, MVP Mm -hmm. ladder. Uh, Thank you all for listening. Uh, Make sure to subscribe to our channel. Also, drop a like on this video and uh, let us know why you hate us in the comments. Yes. See you next time.